trust anyone. There's no kindness left in this world. Just savages who survive by stealing and killing. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. Hey, Georgie. How are you doing? Hi. Well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. So, if we go back to the beginning, was there a defining moment for you to get into the industry? Um, I think there probably was. So, uh, other than, like, so when I was a kid, I used to act. Um, I did drama. I wrote. My cousin and I would always write um plays and whatnot as kids at, at Christmas and, and get all our sisters and brothers and cousins and everything involved. But I think for me, when I finished school, acting wasn't on my radar really. I'd sort of, I'd done it. I didn't think it was for me and I had progressed off and I was going to do it. Um, I was at university studying psychology and I was coming up to my final year, about to my final year exams for psychology. And I was working in a bookshop at the time and I found a book which was about the making of Narnia, the one, um, the one more recently with, um, oh, his name's just gone from my head. Um, anyway, well, the, well, with ben, ben Barnes. No, with know. Professor Xavier. Um, oh. Oh, um, Ian McKellen. No, 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 he, no, he's Magneto. What am I talking about? Yeah, not um, um, <laughs> Patrick Stewart. and not Michael Fassbender, but. Um, Oh, James McAvoy. Thank you. When he's playing um, Mr. Tomnus, and it was yeah. the it was a book about about that. And I've always done a lot of event management um, and sort of just organising things. And I read this, I found this book in this bookshop, and I was like, that looks really interesting. Like, I want to do this. And it was all about the absolute. Um, the huge project management that's involved in creating a film set and you know they set up essentially set up little cities and have to move it around and then I got really interested in sort of the production side and, and being first AD and production manager and um, all the challenges and that so that's actually how I got in I started off doing um, production management and first AD um, and was working on um, an independent feature film in Australia doing that and through that I met um, an amazing acting teacher who was just starting a school in um, Victoria. He'd moved back from the US. And so I sort of very tentatively started to tiptoe around the idea of acting, kind of, I think I sort of knew that once I got involved, I'd probably be hooked and this would this would be it, which I was quite nervous about because it was sort of thought if I open that door, then I'm also opening myself up to the possibility of failure because this is something that I think I'm going to want to do really really um for the rest of my life um so it took me a couple of years and I was on a plane I was actually so that was sort of like the number one point of okay I want to get into the film industry but then when it switched to acting was I was watching um Mildred Pierce in the the 2011 um series or uh, series with Kate Winslet and Guy Pierce, and I watched that coming back I think I've been I was on a plane and Kate Winslet in that role just I thought was phenomenal and she just moved me in such a way it was like this one scene where just her whole life collapses around her and there was something in me that was like that's what I want to do I want to be able to do that and express that and have some and hopefully do to someone else what she's doing to me which is just to really put myself in that person's shoes and feel it which was sort of weird because it wasn't a happy scene it was like her entire life had just crumbled um, and I think that was the real, no, I've got to, I have to give this a go, like the pull to it, so, so strong at that point. And I was like, I can't, I can't tiptoe around just being an AD or a production manager anymore. I have to, have to give this a go. So I started going to classes after that and never looked back. Cool. Yeah, she's a, she's a great British talent that we've got. Um, Guy Pearce on the other side from Australia is incredible as well. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking to him uh, for a Netflix show called The Innocents. He plays the he played the um, uh, the professor in that. Uh, that oh, was doing the that. It's a yeah. great series. It's a great series, and he's incredible in it. Um, and so we we did the premiere for that. Um, like he's just done. He's 
he is such a phenomenal, like when you think about like what he's done from, you know, Memento as well and Animal Kingdom and just so many films um, that often actually people probably don't know about necessarily. Um, yeah, he's just a great talent. Mm. And getting his, I believe he got his start on Neighbours, like a lot of um, Australian actors and actresses. Um, yeah. Like, like even Margot Robbie, look at her now, and she started out as Donna Freeman. Uh, so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so Edge of Extinction, um, a.k.a. The Brink, is about to be released. Uh, what can you tell me about your character and where you fit into the story? Um, so I guess, so I play the girl and none of us are ever given names. So we are, okay. I am, my, my name is the girl. Um, she is in a way the catalyst. So the boy who Luke Hobson plays is sort of living this very, um, he's got it all sorted. I mean, it's not a, it's not a good life, but he is surviving. He's surviving by living under the radar, completely self-sufficient and sort of just getting by. And then the girl comes in and they meet and she sort of, they have a connection that then when she sort of gets captured, which you can see through the trailer, she is captured. It then spirals his entire life out of control because he's lived so, so long on his own and sort of been like, I'm not helping anyone else. This is a game of survival. I'm not doing it. And then they meet and it, it forces him to change his approach, I guess. And then that, kickstarts um, the rest of the story and um, and the sort of journey, I guess, that they go on in each of them. And also with when the man comes in, Chris's character, or sort of facing the, the choices they've made throughout their lives and where they've got to at the start and, and by the end of the film. Okay, great. Um, and obviously with, with the post-apocalyptic setting, what was the atmosphere like on set? Um, so it was it was really good. It was really strange because you'd all get there, you'd all be in your normal sort of gear, and then yeah. you'd have to sit down in the in the makeup chair, and um, Kez, our makeup artist, or, uh, would start to just cover us in mud, fake mud, blood, depending on where we are, bruises, and um, and but then still you're kind of looking at people, and we all look really you know, dishevelled and um, and sad and then you sort of see people on at lunch breaks eating food or having um, on your mobiles. I think it, it was sort of this, like, strange contrast but also I don't know whether it was because it was dystopian and really heavy um, subject matter that we were dealing with. It was a really fun set, so when you weren't filming, when we were on breaks... It was really fun. We all got on really well. It was quite a it was a quite light hearted um, set, and it was a really caring set. So there were a couple of scenes that we did. We always seem to get the costumes wrong. So on like I think there were a couple of days we were filming. It was boiling hot, and we were all in our really winter clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and just you know, the moment the, the cameras stopped, we were all trying to take layers off, and then we'd have to put them all back on and just drinking gallons of water. And then there's another scene where I don't have that much clothing on and it was freezing. It was like five degrees or something. And I was just, and so there you did have people give me blankets and like, because other people were had more clothes on than I did. So they're trying to keep me warm and sort of between set, between shoots, um, trying to keep me warm because otherwise I was just sort of fingers and toes going blue. Um, yeah. So it was a really caring, caring set. Um and then I think in a way that helps you to go a little bit further when the cameras start rolling because you know it's not you're not tired or overwhelmed by everything. You can kind of keep it relaxed when you're not recording. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you feel you feel that like say, you feel safe and um, and you're going to be looked after no matter what. It's yeah. Like definitely. Stress. You probably, that I guess that might be when you've got like a um, like a smaller crew. I suppose that's when you get that more that that side, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, camaraderie. You kind of have that where you're very close knit because there's less of you. 
Um, yeah, whereas I think... on a big production, uh, there'd be a bigger crew and like, it, like not to say that they're not safe because they are. They probably have more safety measures than most than most most places. But um, yeah, there's like there's there's like there's obviously that distinction. Yeah, no, I think you're right, and everyone know everyone sort of knows each other. Oh, you sort of because there's not that many of you. You do meet each other really quickly and and start to form those friendships and relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, um, do you have any memorable moments that will stick with you for the rest of your career? Um, I think there's there's probably a, a couple. We did a really fun all night shoot, um, and. I just think there's always something really special about all night. Like when you're out in the middle of the night and it's 3 a.m. and you you sort of go, what are we doing? Like, and this is crazy. It was a fight scene and you're sort of getting thrown around. And I think I, I fell in a thistle bush. Like we tried to clear everything. There was nothing to fall on. And I managed to find like the one thistle bush to fall on. And you're sort of like, oh, my God. But I just think, you know, when you are filming all night, you do – it, they are just really special and 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 fun um and then we some of the big days where we had all the all the cannibals and like all the um supporting artists there were just amazing you sort of sit there and see this the set that had been created and people going out and you're like this is amazing like this is proper indie filmmaking and just to see what you could achieve where people just who have a passion for filmmaking and want to achieve the same thing what you can do together is really like um inspiring yeah absolutely um uh, luke mentioned that you had a bit of a stunt background um did you find that fun to do um yeah i did so i yeah i've done my i've got like background in dramatic tra um, dramatic combat and doing quite a bit of um training through that and it just made it it made me feel a lot more comfortable so if i have to try and or i have to hit someone you're in a fight and i've got this massive piece of wood it is one really fun to sort of see your training to be able to use your training so you sort of do it so often in classes or for your exams and then actually be like this is what i do it for um, and also, though, the confidence in myself to feel safe that I could do it and that I wasn't putting anyone at risk, but knowing that I could look, make it look dangerous on camera, but um, no, not actually, it wasn't actually dangerous for the person that I was fighting. Um, and that was that was really good because Chris as well has, he was sort of our fight choreographer and sort of being able to help him and, um, only in small ways because like that was his thing but if there was something that I could do with, with lots of people um, when he was trying to because he was trying to he was coordinating fights and managing and acting as well at the same time so sort of being able to bring that little bit of assistance especially from like my moods of knowing what I could do and what was safe and um, just one less thing for him to worry about but um, yeah it was it was fun Awesome. All right. Um, so what is your preferred genre and do you have any favourite films? Um, favourite genre, I guess, would probably be drama. Um, it's I, a lot of my background that, or that I've acted in has been horror or thriller um, and I'm an absolute scaredy cat, so I find it really hard to watch horror films. I get way too scared and they sit with me. So in many ways it probably actually makes acting in horror quite good because you just put me in a dark, scary room and, and leave me there and I will become that sort of person that needs to be terrified on camera really, really quickly and really, really easily. Um, but I do like drama and I'd like to do a bit more action. Um, the ones that really sort of get into the psychology of characters and um, a, a bit more, uh, a bit deeper, I guess. I'd love to do comedy, but it's probably not what I'm naturally, uh, I don't naturally gravitate towards that. I don't, I mean, sometimes I think I'm hilarious, but um, no one else does, so that's fine. Fair enough. <laughs> um, um, 
I was going to say, my favourite film is actually probably, it's sort of a question as to whether it's a, a film or a series, but I would have to say it's the BBC's original series of Pride and Prejudice. Nice, okay. <laughs> yeah, that I absolutely, I love. Um, although sort of any fantasy ones, we're currently going back through watching all the Harry Potters at the moment, and, mm. you know, Lord of the Rings and things like that, like. Too. Yeah, those seem to be a popular binge at the moment. Yeah. Uh, especially those ex extended editions. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind Very of nice strange. that you don't have to keep choosing which movie to watch. Like, well, I'll just start with this and then I've got seven movies to watch or eight movies. Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, one Christmas, I think this was before um, Deathly Hallows Part 2 was available on DVD. Um, on my DVD shelf, I've got like a box set of the first seven Harry Potter films. And one Christmas, I decided to watch them all again. Um, it was a good binge. It was a yeah. good binge. I just watched, the, yeah, I just watched them all. It was a good, good binge. It took it's a couple good. of days, but it was, it was fun. Uh, I enjoy that. I, li I like Harry Potter. I think it's a, I think it's a great series. Yeah, I, I, even like, I, I even like the Fantastic Beast films. Yes, like, so they were going to watch them after this one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have you seen them already? Fantastic Beasts? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, I think they're good. And um, there was something that happened in the second one that I didn't see coming. And, um, I'm going to have to watch them again but, now. Uh, yeah, that I didn't see coming. And uh, that is quite interesting because I've not read the books. So, and I know that I know that uh, Fantastic Beasts aren't based on on any on any books, apart from a textbook that Harry has in I think the second year or something. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, um, but I've not. I, I I don't have the I don't have the the like the knowledge of the of the rest of the law, like what what the actual what what the books could what the books are and what the film could have been if they had because the books are way too vast for them to follow every single plot point <laughs> they had to linear it in the films yeah although i mean i do think they did a, a really good job i mean i've read the books quite a few times and um, that you know there are little things to go oh you didn't make, get to meet that character but the, the general gist i do think they did a really a really good a really good job with them yeah, I mean, the um, there's a major plot point that like that's from the books that I don't think they could have done in the films, uh, like where where it was like there could have been two chosen ones and it could have been Neville. Uh, yeah, I that's true. They, I don't think they could have done that in the films because it's called Harry Potter, um, and I think that'd been a bit too confusing if there was like uh, two plot points that were kind of uh, kind of working against each other. Yeah. Um, in, in that respect, you're following Harry's story, but you also have to keep an eye on what Neville's doing. And yeah, I don't think it would have would have worked for film. Maybe in a TV show where they can actually have the time to actually spend spend time, like what they're doing with um, uh, with his Dark Materials on the BBC at the moment. Uh, they're, yeah. they're they're having more time to to devote to what's actually happening, not condensing it down into two hours, which I think was the main problem of of that film. Because I don't think it was a bad film. Uh, I don't think they had enough time, and it didn't do very well because of, because it didn't have enough time. And they were trying to set up too much stuff in the first film, and um, they obviously didn't get a sequel. And yeah, uh, but TV's t TV seems to be the best place for things at the moment. Um, yeah. like for long form storytelling anyway yeah i think it's sort of moving moving that way as well it gives everyone a little bit as you said more time to develop the story and the characters and everything absolutely um so um are there any other aspects of the film industry that you'd like to pursue so i still really like doing um being first ad um, on, and being on set when I, especially if there's like, if it's a story or a director, if it's a story I really love or a director I've worked with before um, and there's no role for me or just it, it works better for me to be um, a first AD um, or, you know, a second AD or production manager or something, then I do really like um, getting involved and doing, and doing that. Um, probably more the first AD than production manager. I do like I love the chaos of set. I mean, although, you know, you never, the aim is always not to have it as chaotic, 
but um you know the i've been on sets where everything was meant to be filmed outside and suddenly it's raining and you're sort of trying to work out okay how's this gonna what can we switch to where who's available when can i move tomorrow's day to today and things like that um mm -hmm. and i really like that challenge and working with everyone across all the different departments to make sure they've all got enough time to really help the director um capture their vision okay um uh, like um, do you ever uh, has it ever been the case where you've been the first ad as well as acting like and juggling those two those two roles at the same time not at the same time. So there was a day on when we were filming um, Edge of Extinction where the first AD couldn't couldn't be there for the afternoon and my scenes were in the morning. So I said, look, I can stay and um, and do and, and switch over in the afternoon. I sort of would rather I don't I've never done the, the two at the same time because for me it's really very different sides of the brain. And if I'm being in an actor or and trying to be in the situation 100% as that character I don't want to be thinking oh that wasn't there for continuity I wonder if that person's in the makeup chair getting ready for the next scene to all that front we're running a bit late what's the time I just don't want to try and split my um concentration like that I, I don't I've often wondered how people who direct and act at the same time and what they do when they're doing their own scenes um, if they have a really, um, you know, someone there to assist them, but um, I haven't haven't done that, and at, at, as of the moment, not too keen to try and stretch myself that far just yet. Cool. Yeah. Well, may, maybe one day you'll do that and and realize that this is what you're missing all the time, all along. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I'll be like, all right, everyone, and action, go. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Um, good. Yeah, I always find that fascinating with actor directors how they actually do it and keep it all straight in their head because it's got to be because there's two disciplines at least that you've got to work out because you're behind the camera and then in front of it and and I I, I don't because I'm not an actor myself so I have no idea how that would be done. I mean, when we actually make our film, it, I'm going to be doing it on the producerial level. I'm not. I'm and co-writer, but um yeah um i'm not acting in it um i'll leave that to the ones that know what they're doing uh, <laughs> i've just written it um well written written well i wrote it when i was 14. um it's gone for a rewrite and um yeah and the lead character is a female is, is a young woman so i don't feel comfortable writing dialogue for a woman so because I'm not one, so and I'm not twenty. I'm not twenty-five anymore, so um, I'm thirty-six. Yeah. So I can't do that. So yeah. Well, oh, I could, I'm sure, I'm sure you could, but it's probably worth getting someone who has at yeah. least been through that, if not are currently going yeah. through that. Yeah, of their absolutely. Life. Yeah. So so that's what I did. So my co-writer is twenty-five, and she's a woman. So yeah. Well, Perfect. sorry, she's twenty. She's 26 now, but she was 25 when I asked her to do it. So, yeah, be good. Um, all right. So uh, you've worked with a great crop of talent. Uh, do you have a wish list of who you'd like to work with? Uh, well, Kate Winslet. <laughs> Love to work with her. Um, oh, I think there's there'd be so many people that I would just love to work with it and see them work so um Kate Blanchett is another one that I would love I'd love to work on a um I mean I think most people would but like a Christopher Nolan film ones like sort of Inception and things like that which are a slightly more obscure um subject i mean obviously working on batman would have been great but something like that would be amazing as well or i i've also um you know wes anderson someone like that with the slightly quirkier sort of um films i think would be really fun too i i can't say i actually have like a checklist of of people but um yeah they'd be so amazing actors i think seeing someone like Daniel Day-Lewis working as well. Um, 
you know, you hear all these stories of what they like when the camera stopped rolling, but actually just seeing how they do that. Um, mm -hmm. Or like um, Heath Ledger as the Joker, I think, or even um, Joaquin uh, yeah, Phoenix is the Joker. Sorry, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker. Just seeing them as they are when the camera stopped rolling and, and watching how they work, I think would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would have I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall when Heath Ledger was his Joker because that's just incredible performance. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But um, and again, he's another he's another Aussie. So um, you've got a lot of talent that comes out of that. That comes out of yes. that pilot. <laughs> we really do. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, who inspires you within the industry? Oh, that's a good one. Um... I think for me, it's anyone, it's so many people that have come through, like that work within the indie film industry as well, that have really still seem to have a passion for the craft. So there's, I think it can be really easy to get swept up in like the celebrity of it, but actually people like um, that still do the, the more indie films, um, that so another one I think I've, I've, there was an um, interview or something with uh, Jeffrey Rush, another Australian. Sorry, probably these people I sort of grew up <laughs> with. But you know, he was saying he was very happy to do all the parts of Caribbean, the parts of the Caribbean, Caribbean, um, because it you know he only needs to do one of them and he'll get a check that then allows him to go off and do whatever he wants for another couple of years. Um, and that sort of thing I think is, is really inspiring. So um, I'm trying to think of, I, so I was really, I was looking up even to so someone like, it's still Kate Winslet, I know is, uh, I keep going back to her, but she was basically, she wasn't that well known. And then she went to like a cattle call for Sense and Sensibility, which where Emma Thompson saw her. And just so someone that's really done the hard yards and come up, I don't want to say earned their stripes, because I think any actor who makes it has earned their stripes in one way or, or the other. Um, but people that just keep keep pushing. Um, Jackie Weaver is another Australian actress who... I guess got more worldwide fame from Animal Kingdom only a few years ago when she was sort of in her 60s or something. And there was this big, oh, she, you know, ha she hasn't done anything. And she was actually quite big in Australia. And someone that's just kept going and kept going and kept going and had this amazing career in their hometown, or not town, but country. Um, mm -hmm. So those, I think those people who just, you can tell, have a real love for, for acting because of what it is in the stories they get to tell. I think Essie Davis was the same. If I yeah. Remember rightly. Uh, before the Babadook, no one really knew who she was, but she has a huge career over in over in. Uh, is she from New Zealand? Yes, I think so. Well, Probably should know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, like um, yeah, she had a massive career. I mean, even someone like Alan Fletcher, he had a massive career before Neighbours. I mean, obviously, mm. he's, he's known for Neighbours now because he's been on the show for, like, 20-odd years now at this point. Uh, but, um, yeah, he's um, – I like, the first thing I remember seeing him in was he was an airplane – I can't remember the name of the film, but he was an airplane – he was a pilot. Um, right. He was a pilot, and, yeah, he was just incredible in that. And then when I saw him pop up in Neighbours as Carl, uh, Carl Kennedy, that was just – yeah, that's yeah. great. Uh, well, and so, I just thought yeah. someone else as well, like um, – Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and the fact that they wrote Good Will Hunting, mm. that sort of thing as well, people that really go out and write their own write their own work um, and then yeah. get that up and running. And look at their careers now. I mean, exactly. They're, yeah. they're just incredible. Um, I mean, even Margot Robbie, like starting, like as I said before, like starting out in on Neighbours as Donna, um, like to see what she's been able to do now. But her turning point was probably the Wolf of Wall Street, even though I knew of her years before that because I was watching Neighbours. Uh, but, yeah, when she was in the mainstream, that was the White Wolf of Wall Street, and now she's producing. She's got a – is it Lucky Chat Productions that she's got? Oh, I don't uh, know, actually. I haven't yeah, caught I up on that. Yeah, it's Lucky Chat. 
I have to look that up. Um, but yeah, um, she's the produ- she was she was the producer on Harley Quinn on, on Birds of Prey: The Emancipation of Harley Quinn. Um, I probably butchered that that title. It's a long title. Uh, but yeah, she's she's just great, and that film was pre- that film was damn good as well. So yeah, I haven't actually um, seen that one, but I'm gonna I'll watch it sometime. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it, it's really good. It's a really good watch. It's really fun. Um, and like she makes that character her own uh, because obviously uh, Harley started out um, in the animated series and she's one of the only characters that she made the transition over to the comics. Um, oh, okay. so it doesn't always happen that way. Um, it's very rare for that to happen, but Harley was one of them. Um, I believe Diggle from the from um, Arrow also did that because he wasn't in the comics. He was made for the made for the show, I believe, and now he's in the comics. Um, so yeah, that was cool. Um, all right. So, um, what would be your dream role? Um, I think so. The sort of role like a Carrie Matheson from Homeland. Okay. Or um, yeah, someone like that who is a fighter. She can stand strong but she also won't be defined by her sort of having bipolar she won't be defined by that she won't be defined by what's happened to her or what her current um illness is um and i think she's quite inspiring as a character um i do quite like that sort of that sort of role um or is it um Nina from Black Swan, that was played by Natalie Portman. Same oh, yeah. sort of thing. This this woman under intense pressure, to, and there's that physical element within the role. I quite like a psychological or a physical or both element within within the sort of roles. They're the ones that really um, appeal to me. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, uh, two two great ones. I mean, even like Claire Danes, uh, who brought that character to life. To me, that that show finished. I think. A couple of weeks ago was the last episode yeah um, and uh yeah but such a I mean, she's a great actress so I, I um she's great yeah can't can't say much more more than that she, no, she she's is. great yeah um all right so fans are a big part of the industry um who or what are you a fan of oh um i'm a massive fan of i, I really like sort of fantasy action films so marvel i'm a big marvel fan i guess i think probably if you put me up against the extreme marvel fans i am nothing compared to them if you put me up against like most a lot of other people or general people in general i am a big marvel fan um and like i said the those sort of you know harry potter's lord of the rings um those sort of films i really like the kind of yeah fantasy action films cool yeah they're, they're all they're all great um i watched them i've got all the lord of the rings over on my over on my shelf uh I've got all the x-men's uh <laughs> yeah i've got yeah yeah uh, all of them there oh. harry potter's um all, all but one of the harry potter's i haven't got the x yet so yeah I love, I mean, all the X-Men, there's quite a few of them in the more recent videos, which had me, uh, most recent films where I was crying in them just because it's a story's progress and things like that. So I'm a bit of a, a, a silk, yeah. but I do. <laughs> so good. Great. Um, okay, so is there a book that you're a fan of that hasn't been adapted to film or TV or Netflix yet that you'd love to be a part of? There is, actually. Um, and a- Funnily enough, it's a fantasy action one. Um, it's The Invisible Library by Genevieve uh, uh, Cog- Cogman. Okay. Um, and it's about a, it's got all these different worlds and it's, a, it's about a woman called Irene and to stabilize the different worlds and the different dimensions of the worlds, there's a library that sort of holds them all together. So they have to steal books and they're all like secret spy, they're spies and they have to go across all these different worlds and have, you know, amazing knowledge of technologies and languages and everything as they travel around, not just different countries, but different countries in different um, time and space. And then there's dragons and there's werewolves and there's all these sort of things happening at the same time. Um, 
And I've always thought that would be another quite amazing um, fantasy film series. I think there's about five books in the series at the moment. I've always, ever since I read that, I was like, I want to be Irene. <laughs> she gets to do all the stuff. Okay. Great. Uh, let's hope that happens. Um, so with the popularity of streaming services like Netflix and Disney Plus, uh, what do you think the future of cinema is? Um, I think cinema will, there'll always be, a, I, I think there'll always be a place for cinema. I just think maybe it will, I wonder whether it will change slightly. So I think we're in a strange sort of period at the moment where people still watch films at home and they still go to the cinema, but they also watch television series at, at home. And I, I think maybe more and more we will get people watching more serials and um, then episode, episode sort of things at home. And I think um, the cinema will still be a, a nice night out for people. I do think it will be interesting to see what happens as technologies, technology becomes cheaper, to see the sort of films that can be made of really good quality. I quite like the fact that it's being broken down and you don't have to have, there are still films that do have a lot of funding that get into cinema, but you don't have to necessarily have that. You don't need to have a huge crane to be able to have a good quality camera to film, to film things. So I think that will open up opportunities for a lot of, for a lot of people. I think we'll just become more, creative in the way that we consume content but I do still think there will be that the difference between home and going to the cinema it's probably the same way that you know when everyone thought or when Amazon came out all bookshops were closed and there is sort of a resurgence of people going back to actually no I do want that physical book a Kindle or um, a digital book is great when you're traveling but there's something special about having having the physical book and I do think cinema will still have the same element you know in a way it'll come back to come Absolutely. back to that I mean it's the, kind of the same it's yeah. kind of the same sort of thing happened when uh, when digital downloads yeah. came around they thought that was going to spell the end for the CDs they're still around um, yeah. So yeah. And and this is yeah like I can watch TV at home, but it's not the same as having a big, you know, you watch a, a Marvel movie or you watch a movie at, at home and it's just not the same as, unless you've got a huge screen with surround sound in your house, if you're lucky enough to have that, which I just don't, um, there is still that nice element of going to the cinema and making it a special trip. Yeah, I, I watch everything on my laptop or my tablet. Um, so... Yeah, I don't. I don't have like the home cinema thing. I I really. Uh, I I would have loved to have seen it. Um, I would have loved to have seen Endgame, uh, Avengers Endgame, um, in the cinema. Uh, well, I saw it in the cinema, but I would have loved to have seen it in IMAX, on the bigger screen. Uh, yeah. I, I well, I I did see it in IMAX, but I saw it in the one in Leicester Square. I didn't go to the big IMAX to see it. Uh, the one in Waterloo. Um, but I would have loved to have seen that. Uh, in IMAX, that would have been uh, like in look uh, at the in the in Waterloo. I would have loved to have seen that in there because uh, especially oh. that in battle scene, that's just great. Yeah, that would have been and amazing. Again, and again, one of your countrymen is one of the leads in in that. So Chris Hemsworth. And, yep. And he he's yep. one of those. I, I I like Chris Hemsworth a lot. He's one of those that can flip between the two. He can do the the big budget um, like like an Avengers and they can go and do a Netflix film like Extinction, which just came out, Extraction, sorry, uh, which just came out. So, yeah. Um, yeah. He, yeah, he's just great. And they're, they're talking, I haven't seen Extraction yet, but apparently, but they're talking about it, can, it being the next John Wick. So uh -huh, that would be interesting. Right. Um, I need to watch that. I haven't had time to watch it yet. So <laughs> but I will watch it because I like Chris. I like Chris. I think he's great. Um, so uh, just before I let you go, um, Age, of, Age of Extinction is Edge of Extinction. Sorry, is coming out. Um, I think next week, or is it next week? Or yeah, on Monday, uh, on the eighteenth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, what are you hoping that the audiences are going to take away from the film when they when they get a chance to see it? 
I hope they'll, um, I think there's sort of an element of throughout the film, it is, there is an element of hopefulness in a way. I mean, it's a bleak story as a whole, but you do come out of it with um, stronger relationships and at the end there's like a hopeful ending. Um, and so I hope that people will, you know, obviously there are some similarities in a, in a way to what we've gone through of, of just sort of, I mean, obviously edge extension is a little bit more extreme, but um, I do hope people will maybe sort of see that it's what we're in at the moment, what we're experiencing, experiencing, although it's bad, it's not as bad in comparison, but also there is hope in any bad situation there is and there can be hope at, at hope and um, good news, I guess, at, at the end of it. And then I just hope they'll enjoy it. They'll be able to watch it and sort of get away a little bit of what whatever they're going through at the moment and kind of just watch a, a, a film and get involved in that and switch off for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, and, and what are you looking forward to uh, getting back to once we're once the restrictions lifted? I'm really looking forward to a good coffee. Um, <laughs> so I, yeah, love my coffee. Um, and as well as, like, you know, a pint in a pub or something like that, um, I think a good coffee that's not in a takeaway cup for me, so it's sort of when we can go back and sit down, we kind of um, – had gone to the coffee shop just down the road from where we live quite a bit and knew the people there reasonably well. So when they were all closing up, sort of like, we'll see you on the other side, can't wait to come back. So I am sort of, I am looking forward to going back there and just having a, a really good, a good coffee, which, I mean, there's all the things of seeing friends and things like that, which of course is going to be great, but it's um, something as simple as that to me is going to be a big, <sighs> yay. Um, um, Edge of uh, Extinction um, is out on Monday. Um, congratulations with it, and I look forward to seeing what you do next. Take care. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you. You too. Bye. 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 Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more content next time. We need each other. on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.